Hello and welcome to Royale Without Cheese, our bi-weekly podcast in which we discuss both the classic and the unknown of Hollywood and foreign cinema from the then and now. We are your hosts, Meet Mash Ferreira, Miguel Aido. Hello. Hey, hey, and Leonardo Miranda. What a fine morning. What a fine morning to Gun Fu. So we are three filmmakers in an informal dialogue with a film review each episode. As part of our Gun Fu special, reviews in both English and Portuguese will be available for different listeners. Today's episode will be in English and we'll be having a go at John Woo's A Better Tomorrow. Portuguese speakers can head to the Portuguese labeled content section. Don't forget to subscribe, share this episode or simply give us a like. That's how our podcast can grow ever more groovy. 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 <laughs> groovy. Now sit back and hope you enjoy. Better Tomorrow is a 1986 Hong Kong crime action film directed and co-written by John Woo and starring Tai Lung, Leslie Cheung and Xiao, Xiao Yun Fat. And Xiao Yun Fat. The film had a profound influence on Hong Kong action cinema and has been recognized as a landmark film credited with setting the template for the heroic bloodshed genre, with considerable influence on both the Hong Kong film industry and Hollywood. Produced with a tight budget and released with virtually no advertising, A Better Tomorrow broke Hong Kong's box office record and went on to become a blockbuster in Asia, becoming a highly regarded cult classic and ranking on second place under the best 100 Chinese motion pictures by the Hong Kong Film Awards. That's all and well and good, but what did the host of Royal think of its Kung Fu cinematic skills? My thoughts. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. being introduced? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, um, it's my first John Gan Woo Fu. film. I mean, within his, you know, uh, Hong homeland, yeah. uh, Hong Kong, because my first ever John Woo film was Mission Impossible 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a great, uh, great one. You know, introduction through his Western state side of things. But um, as far as the Hong Kong film, A Better Tomorrow, it is the one that is perhaps my best known of his. I know this film for 10 years now, perhaps, and it's the first time that I've seen it. Um, you know, it's one of those things that being the first one within that set culture and with such a specific style to it, in both the visuals, the acting, the music, the sound effects, I think that it is a very strong, it holds a very strong punch and it's not for everyone at first. So it's the kind of thing that leaves me wondering, I think I need to see more to make comparisons if this film holds in quality or not. For example, for you, Leo, I see that, you know, we have talked briefly about this and for you, you know, Better Tomorrow is not your favorite specifically, but I, I don't sense that you've seen it in trust and qualities. I see in it in trust and qualities. Though I wouldn't say it is a, a film that I, you know, it would that would be part of my particular taste. But then again, like I said, I think I, I will need to see more. I want to see more of of who's like a hard boil and and other films to make comparisons, uh, because um, you know it's that kind of thing that um, it has a very strong melodrama quality. So w meaning that the characteristics, the traits in the dramatic treatment of the script. Uh, and the work of the actors is very is is heavy on sentiment, and it can often look ridiculous. <laughs> and so you have these dramatic scenes, often inter often intermingled with action scenes, where people, you know, within a family in the film, try to save each other from the hands of death against the evil forces in the film. But you don't really believe it. You don't really. Or when, or when you have an actual, not an action scene, but an actual argument in a family happening in the film between the two brothers, you know, the gangster brother and the cop brother against each other. I mean, those are actually, those are, you know, are one of the moments that I actually believe more. But even then, because the music is so, so popperish uh, with the twangs and the, the pianos and, you know, the, the cello that is in it, 
and you know the awkward editing and the awkward ad- acting that is so shouty. Uh, I, I do have a difficulty piercing the films in her heart that she so much wants to to make me believe. You know, because I think it's the kind of film that in the, within this genre, I imagine that you must have. It's so easy to say it's bad. You know, it's so easy to say that it's a bad film or that is distasteful <laughs> because of its style but it's that thing i need to see more to fully understand what is good uh, because it's a very particular style of making uh, a film uh, it's just, it's very you know it has very akin to soap opera and you know the melodrama can seem a bit overwhelming you know in this genre you may have films that are you know uh, heroic bloodshed genre films that are bad and where the plot is just there to serve a purpose which is to show the sexy side of the film, which is the gun fu action. You know, action is what matters in these films and, and the plot, the melodrama, the dramatic stuff is just there to create a kind of story. Or then you have the great heroic bloodshed genre films, which I don't know if this is one of them. I assume it is by what, yeah, you know, I mean. the majority <laughs> of commentary says. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Where the melodrama is actually worked uh, in fine tune with the action and it has the right balance. And sometimes I sense it has. You know, sometimes, for example, I really like the some of the ideas in the film of uh, I'm really engrossed in certain in certain moments. What I mean to say, the film surprises me in uh, the relationship between Sung or Ho, whatever you know his name is. Uh, oh. Ho, I think is 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 how he's referred to, the main character, the the ex gangster trying to to turn to the good side after he's released from prison. And his relationship with his brother, I think that with his brother, there is a cop, you know, an inspector investigating his case, his relationship with his former gang. Um, I think the most interesting scenes in, is when he gets out of jail, this main character, Ho, and reunites with his old buddy, uh, Mark, and then with his brother. And he has these intimate scenes with them that, yes, are melodramatic, but at the same time, the actors really sell it. And uh, the editing has well. Uh, I, I really and, and it's the fact that the concept behind uh, what's implied in the narrative, uh, this older brother that is a gangster and this younger brother who, you know, I mean, he looks too far too young to be an inspector. That's the thing for me. You know, yeah. I don't believe that that kid is a cop. I mean, to me, it's laughable. That's what kind of makes sometimes laughable. The whole thing is it's, it's these little things. So winter. Ha- but at the same time, I think is what gives this poignancy to the film is the fact that he is so young and there is this undertone, this emotional undertone of trying to not only excel as a professional, as a cop, but also to excel as, you know, I'm not your younger brother anymore. I'm not that, that kid that you saw in the, at the beginning of the film, you know, how I am the, I, I have actually grown up, you know, and, and you have these, these notions of a guy who's been to prison and this younger brother who's trying to prove to, to, to his older brother who didn't watch him grow up, who, did, who wasn't there to see him change as a person, to really at another level make him see that I actually now I'm grown up. You know, I, that's what I'm, you know, that's why I like the, in the character of Kit, the younger brother. It's that he's always relentlessly trying to show something to his older brother at the level that is more uh, of an inner dimension that the film doesn't say but you feel which is this thing of trying to show to the older brother that he actually has some worth and that he actually can take him down and i that's one of the strongest attributes of the film the lesser attributes like i said is when you know the the you know the music to me is very uh, difficult to grasp in some like i was laughing through and through when the father died i'm sorry like when the father dies <laughs> and that's it, it, to me it's kind of part of the appeal you know like the when the father dies and the girlfriend of kit is there in the room i mean the action is very engrossing it's amazing the editing of the action but at the same time you know the girlfriend is always being thrown around and to kick her face and it's like i'm laughing <laughs> it's so stupid she's like ah <laughs> it's just fucking ridiculous i don't know what do you it's think it's okay about? to laugh it's okay to laugh right but at the same time I'm like sh- what should i feel about this because at the end they're like oh my god dad oh my god and i'm like are you serious right now no I- i'm i'm on the floor with this whole scene i like i cannot take this seriously i, I don't care even the knife getting in into this guy like i'm surprised because i wasn't expecting it but at the same time i'm laughing <laughs> in the middle of the whole thing so 
it is very difficult to understand how I can relate with it sometimes. Do I take it seriously or do I laugh? Uh, I sometimes you can, you can laugh at something and take it seriously. I mean, mm. I take the film seriously, but at the same time, I'm I'm having fun. I'm laughing at it. It's fine. Even if the laughter and the and the seriousness happens at the same time. Yeah, I mean, the film is obvious. The film isn't. To me, it's very clear that the film is like over the top intentionally. It's not like it's very soap operish, as you say. It's very melodramatic. The the emotions are very big, in a very direct way. You know, the whole brotherhood the questions of brotherhood and loyalty you know it's about the idea of of, of these problems more than a, a very well-developed drama or mm -hmm. anything else. Uh, this is an interesting question actually what do you think that i mean from the perspective of john Wu, uh, what do you think is the interest behind making a melodrama do you think that with this you know high octane emotions and sentimentalism do you th because it's not subtlety so it is interesting to inquire if this is a case of it, it, the filmmaker intentionally does this and searches to make a drama that is very heightened in emotions and does not care for subtlety. What would be his interest? Is it because he cannot do better or is it because um, he's trying to achieve something with it of more eloquent within the genre? What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I mean, as far as melodrama goes, I don't think it's necessarily a question of can he do it better because... Um, for me, it's 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 multiple things that make it uh, a melodrama, from the choice of the the cast, <laughs> which is not just a director's choice. I mean, he has obviously most of the of the control, but a lot of people are are deciding that. And when you choose the actors, you you're also choosing the sort of acting you have you're gonna get. So, um, I think that. Um, so many things make up uh, what is ultimately then a melodramatic film. Um, the choice of, of the framing, how long you, you take in them, in the shots. Um, and then, you know, there's so many slow motion, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, shots. So obviously that's a decision that comes afterwards as well, which he could not do. So for me, it's an extremely intentional the way he wants to do melodrama. Um, and not, not necessarily... Uh, in fact, not at all. That because he can't do it better. Um, yeah, but uh, what do you what do you think? I mean, even if it's because he can't do better, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm not going to ask Wes Anderson, "Why do you do it like this? Can't you do a better film? Can't you do something <laughs> different?" <laughs> it's like it's just his style, and I like it. But I do think a better tomorrow is the one I of the three Hong Kong films I saw. Uh, it's the one I like the less. It's I still like it, but. I think it's the least effective one in every aspect in terms of the emotions and in terms of the action. Uh, I think the action scenes in the other two I watched, which are The Killer and Hard Boiled, are just so much better and the emotions are much better. I think, yeah, I understand why this film is so highly regarded because of the influence especially. It came at a time, you know, it drove forward this genre, the heroic bloodshed. Um, so I understand why it's so influential. But I think John Woo, after, he built on it much better on his other films. Yeah. And I mean, Tomaj was saying, um, you know, how he didn't believe the cop, uh, the guy was a cop, a kid. Um, I think part of that is also because he has a, such an older brother. I mean, I, I don't really understand <laughs> yeah. how these the guys are brothers and have such a, a relationship of two brothers that would be sort of the same age. Uh, I don't know. I just imagine, you know, when two brothers are so many years apart, they're a bit different in, in how they act with each other and in their relationship with each other. So, you know, one is like 16, the other is like... 35 or 40, it's... 40 weird. even, I would say. <laughs> Tony, let's say, I think it's Tony Leung. He's 30 here. He just looks super young. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah oh he's 30 God. years old. He's a very oh. famous... He's like a, a, a singer. He sings the song. The -na -na, -na. Um, yeah, he's like 30 years old here. I think, I think it's a matter of he looks very young for 30 and the other he guy looks, looks very... He looks, he looks older than that, you know. I think does, it's because what? of... 
He looks yeah, yeah, older yeah. than thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just does. said he looks super young. No, no, he looks. No, no, he looks. He looks. I was saying, uh, he looks like forty. No, I think. Wait, wait, is, is Tony? Oh no, no, wait. I'm, I'm, the kid, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, messing yeah. around. I'm uh, confused. <laughs> you got him yeah, yeah. confused. Yeah, yeah. And the other guy looks probably w- way older than his actual age. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but there it's a, again a matter of casting. They cast a guy who looks super young and put him next to a guy who looks very old. And, their brothers. And, and you know, even making it weirder is how they talk about the relationship from the past, as if they have so many things before. And let's go back to how we used to be. It's like the guy sixteen. Well, what is the past <laughs> to you guys? <laughs> like uh, last year or something? <laughs> I mean, I guess that what you history know, do you have? <laughs> to me, uh, the fact that he's so older. I mean, that's also makes it interesting because it is an unpredictable relationship. Like you say, you know, normally in these type of relationships, you would expect that they would be of different personalities, of different maturities, and so not relate as much. But there, there's also the possibility, although being an exception of the kind of brothers that one is very, you know, is older, the other, the other very young. And, but to create this bond, and I like the idea of this bond of this older brother, despite being very old, much, much older than him, he saw him be born, grow up, you know, his younger brother. And so he's there for him. You know, it's almost like, I don't know, I can see the possibility of them having close relationship and the past being, even if the past is just 16 years of, um, the last sixty years, sixteen years of host life, the older brother. I can see it as you know, uh, possible, believable the relationship. You know, it's just Kit has a cop that that kind of is uh, messes my brain. I don't believe it so much. Yeah, um, it's I mean, like it's, it's almost like they make now he has a new jacket. Oh my god, does he he'll grow up so much? <laughs> like he's the film almost says that you know he shows up with the with a rubber and you know handcuffed at. The police station and like oh my god he has a jacket now Ooh, it's like <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> i mean but that's the it's playing on the fact that yeah he wants that respect too that he wants from his brother too but there's that conflict of them being on different sides of the law I mean, and that's such a typical trope not typical i mean it's a very popular trope even point break does it of the two guys on different sides of the law, but that develop a bond and that have a bond or there's and a actually, conflict there. There's a, an, even another conflict, which is the same with Point Break, which is how the how Gary, Busey, um, Gary Busey's character kind of weighs the, you know, respecting the, the sort of sheriff of the police or listening to Keanu Reeves. Um, so this is like his older brother in a sense. Um, and who he, who does he listen to? True. I mean. Both films are also building on that brotherhood and the, the question of whose loyalty you are bound to. Or... It uh, borrows heavily influence from uh, the American film noir. You know, I think that, you know, Hong Kong has an intimate relationship with the United States, both, you know, in the, in the economic philosophy that they have, you know, it's, uh, it's in the south of China and the south of China, you know, the coast, it's very different from... The north and inner side of the of the country, it's, it's it's a capitalist, you know, kind of bay in modes of of operation. So the lifestyle that you get in this film from early on, even in the names of the characters, like you said, a lot of people in Hong Kong have American names like Mark, Kit, you know, the the kind of names that show up here, and um, and even you have you know Hong Kong actors that immigrated from Hong Kong to America and appeared in films. I think Bruce Lee, if I'm not mistaken. He's from Hong Kong. I'm not sure. Would make sense but, with um, his name. <laughs> <laughs> I would assume, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, even Xiao Yun Fat is, is, was originally Donald uh, Xiao, I think, um, which was a cool name. There are, there, are, there are not enough Donalds. I like Donald. <laughs> Except Donald Trump. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that, that was one too much. Yeah, so I think that it is a very interesting. When Once the film opens, you get access to this kind of you know, very specific lifestyle in the film that you don't get when you see other Asian films, I, I sense. You know, when you get a Japanese film, you get a Japanese film. When you see a Taiwanese film, you get a Taiwanese film. You don't get this mix, this mix mash with another culture from the outside of that local culture or in the East. But here you have the American culture in the names, you know, in the way they dress up, you know, with the long coats, the overcoats, uh, 
the dollars in, a, in an Asian context, you know, once you open in and have that counterfeit facility where, where Mark and Ho enter and the fast paced cutting, you know, which is very reminiscent of Edgar Wright cutting, you know, in the kind of baby driver, thieves are cool, you know, there's a kind of almost because of the clothing that they show up at the beginning, the way they present Mark, you know, just eating from, you know, uh, from a hot dog stand in the middle of the street, then going with Ho on the car. And there's a kind of play and humorous to to both of them has brothers, friendly brothers, because, you know, did you like the hot dog or whatever he was eating? You know, and he puts his finger on Ho's mouth <laughs> and there's a sense of play with the whole thing <laughs> to go to the counterfeit lab, yeah. very fast paced cutting, you know, to, to, and at the same time that you're watching, watching their friendship, you know, how it, they operate, how the ease that they have with one another. You see how the whole facility works. You see that the facility needs that disc that kind of becomes a MacGuffin by the end of the film that allows the operation to be successful and to create these fake dollar bills that they counterfeit. And, uh, you know, the, their whole, the whole pleasure in their faces, as you see reflected in their sunglasses, the dollar bills as they're made. I mean, there's a whole, you know, choice in style and that is very interesting and makes the whole of uh, the criminal life very fashionable, very rich, very attractive, very sexy. You know, th those are the words that get... To you, almost like in a Martin Scorsese film, uh, it's there's a a kind of glorification of. He's very of cool. Crime life. Chow Yun Fat, yeah. especially, is like super. Chow Yun Fat cool. is very cool. Like the I glasses, said, his expressions. The coat. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> his, his smile, his expressions, you know, the way he uses his tongue, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. weird. He's just having fun. He's just, he's just having fun with it. It's like it's, it's like he looks at money like, oh my god, ah. money man. You know, like, you know, of course, like he's never of course. Saw money before. Is that uh, Mark? Mark Lee? Mark Lee, yeah. Yeah, yeah Mark. And uh, yeah, whenever whenever Mark gets angry, it's always very funny to me. Because it's like... <laughs> <laughs> it's always shouting. Everything gets turned up up to 80 and it's just... It's very amazing. I mean, it's interesting to me that you say, you know, make it glamorous and sort of uh, fashionable even. Um, because, should you know, you? I can... Should you make it glamorous? You know, there's a. But that's I think another the question. Just, but that's I, another let me question. just yeah. let me just comment the <laughs> the one thing I was gonna say. But I can't return to that. But uh, it's just that you know I think you use a slow motion kind of also in in wanting to do that uh, because you know uh, if you compare it to Scorsese as we, as you were saying uh, and and the violence in his films it's you know it's brute and it's it's right there and it it doesn't take time and we, and when you have slow motion with John Woo it's like you really like enjoying the blows, enjoying the punches, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and seeing everything in detail, and I think that kind of contributes to the to the fashionable way in which um, these characters move around this this uh, underworld of of counterfeiting and and gangster um, Hong Kong gangster <laughs> scene. Um, at least to me, I think that it really makes it seem almost a bit beautiful, um, like. Uh, I don't know, like like everything is coordinated and symmetrical. I mean, the shots that he that he has of Mark uh, with the blood splashing out of his nose yeah. when he's being beat up in that roof. I mean, to me, it seems like um, it's less violent and, as you said, more um, uh, you know, almost uh, respectful in a, in a sense because he has a slow motion rather than just completely uh, beating him up and leaving him there to die. Um, so I think you know John Woo. I think is is very conscious of what he's doing, um, and in 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 doing this, uh, really makes it all the more melodramatic. And um, yeah, uh, that's it. But again, he does this. I think wanting to show that that side of Hong Kong. Um, yeah, in a sense, kind of in a beautiful way. So to go back to the question that you had, you were asking. I know I don't know if you should, but I think he does it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I mean, in these very, it's very specific. It's about this, like, because he respects that these guys have like a like a code and an honor amongst themselves, yeah. and there's a certain lines that you can cross. Like I think that's more that's very clear in the when uh, uh, that scene is awesome. The when he goes to the restaurant to get revenge on the guys. That whole scene where he, it begins with him like slowly walking, he's smiling, very happy, he's putting guns in, in <laughs> yeah. the... But it's like, 
It's like he's making he's took he's making two actions at the same yeah, time. Yeah. He's groping a girl, seducing her at the same time as he's hiding the weapons, which is great, you know. And like you showed. Like you showed in Boiling, I think it was uh, Hard Boil, he, there's also this thing of him hiding guns in unsuspic- unsuspicious places. There in... Uh, uh, in Hard Boil, is the other way around. It's other people uh, hiding ah, okay. guns. Yeah. Right. He's a cop there. Yeah. But it, it's very interesting. I, I think that I have seen, for example, John Wick doing a similar thing as well. And John Wick, the franchise, takes heavily inspiration, I think, from John Woo. Because, you know, uh, the whole choreography with the guns... Uh, although, you know, you have that a lot more developed with John Woo and there's a, a greater fixation on making them, the whole action with them, with the gunfire, a dance, you know, and a methodic thing here, you know, it's more, I think the soundscape is what is delicious. I think how he uses uh, the soundscape with, with the guns. I mean, uh, it's not like Ser- Sergio Leone, you know, he's, the way he portrays gunfire and, and the muzzle shots you know it's very fake it's not real and while here i feel it has very you know it's very de- detailed you know shots very specific and i'm in the action i think it's one of those films one of those earlier films in in, in cinema uh, that uh, i really believe the action you know so sometimes i i don't believe the action in for example Sergio leone films i don't really believe the action because the soundscape is not a realistic soundscape but here I, th- I thought, although stylized, although the slow motion that, you know, dilates time, the, the, the process of how to treat sound is very interesting and really buys you, engrosses you in the action. And uh, It's interesting you're because, always turning, uh, yeah. you, know, you know, the same way that special effects have evolved and you, you become more and more demanding of, of their quality. And so you true. really can't look at true, true, the same true. things back when they were so very fake and you know i think sound evolves the same way in sound design so uh, you know as you said you go back to those films of sergio leone and you really can't uh, although I there are films sergio today leone, there are films that. there are films today that don't have in my opinion don't have the quality that john Wu has in terms of soundscape like mm-hmm. it, it's just so yeah, yeah, probably. well done uh, yeah, I think or even a, a michael mann like in uh, in heat for example yeah uh, which is another film again from the same in uh, the same vein crime action. Yeah, yeah crime action this love between men <laughs> yeah. that they love yeah but you know uh regarding you know we're making a little comparison by talking about marty scorsese and um john Woo. i find interesting that mike mentioned the fact that you know marty scorsese is very quick in the way he portrays death and murder and then john Woo has a slow motion and that may be apparent at first but i think you know they, they are both stylized to me just in different ways. For example, I think that on a visual uh, standpoint, you know, the deaths in Martin Scorsese films like Casino, Goodfellas, and etc. happen uh, on a larger, you know, tone pretty quickly. You, you see the death, you see the gun, pow, pow, you know, and then the, the hitman goes away. And But the thing is, there's a sort of dilation of time, not through slow motion, but through the music, the way he uses music, the rock music of the era, like House of the Rising Sun. It's, it's like you get, it's as, it has this romanticized look or vision of um, killing someone. It's, it's not something that, you know, you, you, you see... Um, has in a has in a greedy you know crime action film that that would that would make it for example a static shot held in the ground watching the scene in a very sober way seeing the shots the blood and and very minimalistic it, it's 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 almost like there's a dilation of time not through the, the slow motion but through the music I feel like because it, it you know it makes it it transcends the what is realism and so in that same vein i think that he that he does the same or similar to um to john Woo, despite not using slow motion but the slow motion in john Woo is very interesting even then doesn't uh, like i think scorsese depends on the death for i think joe pesci's death in goodfellas yeah, isn't it like slow death. i think there's slow motion there even if i'm not mistaken the way this but maybe it's more the build up to the killing it is like slowed down yeah but it depends on the death for sure yeah i mean for example the death of, also the death of uh, joe pesci in <laughs> the death of joe pesci again in casino is really gruesome and it's a very different death because uh um, yes. you know he gets whacked in the head and then 
uh, by his own friends, because that's what mafia does. You know, they, they ask your own friends to kill you because that's kind of a, a respectful thing to do. <laughs> and so you get your friends whack you over and then, you know, they bury him in the middle of a cornfield. It's pretty gruesome. It's, pre it's more, you know, possibly one of the most gruesome and horrible deaths that the Martin Scorsese has produced on film. You know, it's, it's, it's because, you know, Joe Pesci becomes this very naked body filled with blood and thrown into the dirt and like with no emotion whatsoever. Um, and that's very different from what, was, from what, I, what I was just describing right now, where death is romanticized. Death, I kind of felt it in a bad way, like, oh my God, this is, this is hard to watch. <laughs> I think it's a stylized uh, a stylization that goes more into the direction of respect. Like Scorsese clearly respects the mafia and these guys, and he wants uh... to show that in these scenes. Respect in the sense of the power that they have. I don't mean they... Right, okay. Uh, so like uh, you, you know these guys are are serious you know you shouldn't mess with them that's what I mean uh -huh, um, uh -huh. I'm not saying Scorsese is a gangster because, chill because, you know it's good to talk about what do you mean by the word you know respect what matter I think it's interesting I mean you, have, to, you, you can to, have respect you know, for bad people I mean, yeah course. exactly I think he does he, he has respect for those guys I think he even sort of looks up to them in a in a way that is I'm you know complicated to, I'm just trying to establish uh, respect in the sense of fill in the gap, you know, respect in the sense of, I, I presume for what I'm reading, in the sense of how methodic they are, in the sense of how, you know, how you shouldn't mess they with are, them, they uh, are, how yeah. brutal they are. That's why he captures the scenes and spe specifically the one you mentioned in Casino, the way he does, I think. You know, the, the, just because the word respect, I think, is a bit too strong for me. I would say curiosity. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't no, know. no, no, no. <laughs> respect. He, he doesn't do all these films for curiosity. Uh, for the yeah, exactly, exactly. No, no, like, uh, he comes <laughs> from a place. He comes from... <laughs> Interesting. No, no, it's, I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying curiosity in the sense that he's a... Uh, uh, a mindless fan who just wants to show something. Oh, how fun is this? Is you know, I'm not saying that. He clear he clearly comes from a culture, you know, who uh, you know in America, the, the Italian American immigrant, and a specific part of the Italian American immigrant who has seen guys like this on the street. He he himself says it or has said it. Yeah, exactly. Know, in kind of behind the scenes. So he is aware. There is an awareness. And um, what I'm saying is, if not curiosity, let's say the word interest. He's, he's very attracted to these to these people. I mean, the word respect is just strange to me. I wouldn't use. But the what word is respect. the problem with respect? It messes up with me, you know. I mean, it's respect. You know? I don't think Goodfellas works if you don't think there's some respect there. Like how? Mm. Like what else is? I is, guess you know the first you know? half is about not the first half, but the whole him falling in love with that lifestyle. It's about there's a respect there that I think Rosa Scorsese completely sees, but. He deconstructs it like the, it's a complicated one. Of course, it's not a you know. Oh, these guys are awesome! I love them. It's no there. Okay, that's where I want to reach out with the discussion of respect because that's just the word respect. I mean, <laughs> yeah, don't just... you know the meaning of no? The word I mean, I, come on, Mike. You know, it's difficult to talk about respect when we're talking. I mean, out of the romanticization of these, out of the romanticization of these people, these are pretty gruesome people with no moral standards. Okay, like, uh, come on. I mean, yes, they have moral standards they in the sense of their standards. honor, yeah. but it's a very you know muddied kind of honor and sympathy that they have mm -hmm. i think you know it's uh yes but here it's almost like a fear you know it's re it's respecting the sense of fear you know you you understand what these guys can do that's what respect is you know you you know that they're capable of doing the things that they say they can they mm -hmm. say they do so yeah uh, uh, yeah no i know i just wanted to you know develop this conversation in that <laughs> sense to really inquire on the word respect because i think it's complicated precisely because it's complicated that's why i want to talk about it because i don't think to apply the word respect you know, to these kind of people, it's complicated to me. It's not logical. It's not logical. It's not logical question. It's not logical. I just want to know because yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the viewers, makes sense. the listeners, want to know what the fuck are you doing? Oh no, these guys love the mafia, man. Love <laughs> mafia? Do they have connections? Let's find out. Let's find out. Yeah, the Portuguese. Uh, let's mob. wrap this up now. <laughs> yeah. Now to our sponsors, the mafia. <laughs> the mafia. <laughs> anyway. Uh, other aspects of A Better Tomorrow coming back around the film. I have, uh, I think, something I really like about the film, and not just this one, but the other John Woo films. It's like the physical aspect of it. And I also apply that to Point Break, which I also really liked in Point Break. 
not to get ahead of ourselves, but it's the physicalness of it all, like the elements. Here, obviously, it's the gunshots. You really feel everything, like, and it comes to the soundscape as well. But then there's also these moments of raining where he focuses on their faces and they're all wet and looking at each other. There, I, I don't know. There's a there's a real feeling. I think he's great at filming faces, and I know, like emotionally, maybe it's not the most well developed or the most subtle narrative as we were speaking earlier. But I think when you get to that final act and you're in the um, where, where the bad guy is telling them, I'm going to, I'm just going to pay my way out of this. I'm just going to pay them whatever. And then they look at each other and, um, uh, Ho kills the guy and Tony Leung kid is just the way he looks. He's so, his face is so dejected. Like, I can't believe we had to do this, but at the same time, you, you feel like the, for the first time, these two brothers understand each other. And I think it's all because of the faces and the focus of, of John Woo on Tony Leung's like wet face, all <laughs> like the hair all coming down. Yeah. I think it's really powerful. And that's something that I really liked in Point Break as well. Yeah, in the scene where the, the guys come to the, the garage and they start beating everyone up, there's also plenty of really cool face shots of the guys going against the car and then there's this one where he really stands there for a long time and then gets beat up again against the, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. grid of the car. It's so a pretty he, cool edit. Yeah, he has plenty of great shots. Usually very well interacting with the environment, specifically the, the glasses breaking, going against the wall, something like that. It's always very well infused. You sent that guy who jumps, gets shot, and then his face gets plummeted yeah. into the... I really laughed when that so happened. Good. I mean, what was that, what was that hitman He was thinking? really confident. He was really committed. That's just not commitment. That's like, I really I really want to do this. And I've been trying budget jumping for a while. So I, I, this is the time to apply this. <laughs> he just... He, I mean, let's think about... He throws himself... Yeah, hands had a gun. Like free, he doesn't have hands a gun free. or anything. Just goes. There's like three, two cars in front of him still to reach the the the, the chow, and it's like there's no way, there's no way you're gonna get him. And how are you gonna get him? Like you're opening your arms to get shot, my friend. And I was like, it's just employee crazy. of the month. <laughs> yeah, but it's I mean, like, setting, kind of... setting the setting the motivation aside, it's pretty cool the scene itself because even the the, the editing, it's done with the sound. Uh, you know, it's done I, I think that's one of my Very favorite well shootouts in the film. To be to be fair, like because there's a sense of desperation and tension to the fact that Chow or Mark, uh, the character, is outnumbered by the amount of people that he has surrounding them in this garage. Like other scenes seem more minimal, but uh, that's one of my interest, mo most interesting ones because he has to go up in the building, come down again. You know, so there's a lot of levels to what he needs to do to, to get where he wants to, to get, you know. Um, it's almost like a, a video game in the sense, you know, man enters building, needs to get this item, come out. Uh, so that's the most, uh, I think, effective action scene in terms of the, the tension. Yeah, I think the action in this film is more, it's more, it's more contained than his other films. It's true. Because I do feel that that you're saying. I haven't seen the others, but I feel like the action, you know, it's it's no John Wick. Yeah, no. But for example, I see the scene that you share with us with Hard Boiled. Hard and I think yeah. that's more interesting somehow. You know, there's a more of a, a range. I mean, in that scene, it's the tea house uh, shop scene. And it's the intro of the film. It's like the first scene. It opens with that. Oh, wow. It's okay. insane. <laughs> and then it's only up from there. Every other, I mean, not every, but most of the next action scenes like top it are even better especially towards the end there's like a 40 minute scene in a in an hospital which is just insane yeah i don't yeah compared to the killer and to hard-boiled i think a better tomorrow for me is just it's a step down it's not it's not as impressive it's not as emotionally fulfilling it's more of a yeah, I respect it in the sense that it's a super influential film and I see it from that lens and I enjoy it as a melodrama, as an action film, you know, it's almost as a musical. I think it makes sense to approach an action film like a melodrama or like a musical in that it's uh, hyper-stylized 
and broader emotions. I think that's what Wu really gets at in that I don't see as much other, especially in the West, probably, Western directors approach a film like in this super over the top, but art felt and there's an earnestness to the over the topness of, of John Wu. Like this, mm -hmm. like for example, the, the relationships between men, it's very emotional. It's very deeply felt. They really love each other. And I feel like a lot of uh, directors here in the West shy away a bit from that and keep things a bit more distanced, which it's a fine approach too, but I don't know. It's, it's unique to see, especially like in hard boiled, I think, or is it the killer? There's one where they so clearly like declare their love for each other, or he declares his commitment to, to this man. I think that's true. It's a unique thing. And I appreciate it. I think the only other director, although in a different way, but that I see, do like this sort of masculine bromance type of thing in a very earnest way is probably Michael Mann, like in Miami Vice or Heat, mm -hmm. uh, even Public Enemies a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good attribute in the film, I think. It's the, the bromance. Um, and, you know, Ho and the character of Ho and Mark, you know, they're very interesting to, to that degree and how they come back to each other and the sense of, this sense of um, of honor, of loyalty that there is in the film really comes a lot from their friendship. And I think that it's, you know, the little details such as, you know, Mark, after Ho's imprisonment, he does his revenge. You know, he kills the guy that, um, not betrayed, but was part of the conspiracy against Ho and that put him in prison, in jail. And, uh, you know, he gets something out of it. He gets cursed. He becomes this almost kind of a Quasimodo in the rest of the film because he he has this kneecap blown out. So he needs to walk with this kind of apparatus around his his leg, this metal thing that clicks in a very strange way. It even becomes part at one point of the music piece, I think, which is interesting. And I really love the shot that he where, where he films um, that shot, that white shot that, that Wu has of Mark going down his new home after his fall from grace, which is essentially a garage. You know, he lives in a big white garage, a red garage, public garage, and he needs to come down this uh, entrance where not even people can go. It's, it's where the cars go. So it's like he's lesser than a person right now. He's lesser than a gangster. He needs to go down that entrance in this very wide shot. And you feel like you're entering another world. And then you see him, you know, his, his home is being, you know, sit, you know, you see him sitting on a, on a chair in the middle of, uh, debris of uh, you know of dirt of trash and he's eating his lunch you know it's it's degrading it's it's sad you know in these little things and those little things those little details that are purely visual makeup for whatever you know uh, melodrama that becomes so overwhelming and so over the top in the dialogue I think uh, you know it's it's those little um, details in the mise en scène and in in, in uh, the age of the actors, like I was mentioning, the fact that, you know, you have this so, so much younger brother, so much older brother together only adds up even more to, to the, to the pathos in their relationship and what the younger brother is trying to prove to the older, even though it's purely physical, even though it's purely visual, uh, I think it balances off the, the high intensity of the melodrama that I cannot so much buy into. And that is not subtle at times. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting. John Woo also appears in the film. I don't know if you know. John Woo also appears in the film as an inspector. You know, one, another thing that I really like is the fact that he takes time to show uh, host time life after prison beyond the family, beyond the family dynamics with his younger brother, Kit, and Mark. He, he actually shows how he earns a living. He shows a little bit of the urban living in Hong Kong. What is this of a con man? A con man, you know, an ex-con, I mean, convict trying to find a job. And I find that very interesting. I find, you know, it's, you know, specificity is key to the director's work. But it's partly because it's also narrative important <laughs> because then it's, it's the whole thing with the garage and the guys coming to his workplace. So it, yeah, it, but you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it could have been another job. 
it, it could have been another place. You know, he didn't need. Yeah, to but then the faces can be beat up against the cars. <laughs> you know. Yes, of course, of course. A garage course. is you, a perfect we, place. We need faces beaten up against cars. Of course, we need that. <laughs> that's that's in the pitch meeting. You know, that's a requirement. <laughs> but um, I mean, and now that I think about it. it he likes to film faces as much as he likes to film cars because there's so yes, many cars yes, yeah. everywhere in this. Yeah, true. True, true. But I think that's, a, uh, you know, I mean, in the writing process, I imagine, I think that's a consequence of him choosing first to, to have this in the film, to, to show him getting this job at the taxi company. And I just like the fact, I mean, where does it, you know, it's a very difficult question, almost like all of a sudden the film turns sociological on, on the viewer, like, what is a sociological question? How does an ex-con man get a job? And I'm like, wow, I mean, I'm actually interested in this. Like, I found myself, yeah, how does he get How does a convict because, get a job in Hong Kong? Uh, in Hong Kong. What are the statistics? Because I'm really wondering, like, I mean, how does, it, you know, you can make almost an entirely different film about just that alone has a theme, you know, and that's, that's interesting. How does one get a job after leaving jail? Because there must be a lot of places who don't accept, you know, former prisoners. So it's interesting to see a taxi place that, you know, first and foremost is made of ex-convicts. You know, that's, yeah, that's pretty so cool. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> At that first, the whole dynamic in the conversation with the boss of, of with the boss of the company is like, we do not accept you know, <laughs> every responsibility. You know, this is this whole dynamic of him being harsh. What, what is what is he going to say? But once he reveals that that's a company of ex-convicts, he's like, "We are all brothers, yeah!" yeah. <laughs> like it's all a party. So and clearly, it's, it's not something that they're advertising to the people. No, it's yeah, not sure, exactly. <laughs> of course not. Here, like, come, uh, <laughs> yeah. come being driven by by like, yeah, by like, <laughs> like a tourist attraction. Oh my god! Uh, any comments on the music? On the um, on the music composition, Miguel. Uh, no, I mean uh, it's. Come on, minute. <laughs> on that one piece, you mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you have the cello is a motif throughout the film, but you have other things, you know. I, I mean, I would no, be no, curious. I, I mean, it's very like um, what I would expect from this genre and this film, and uh, even this this eighties films. Um, you know, it's just very the what aesthetic. I yeah yeah well, the aesthetic of of everything that these films make. Um, I just yeah, I just wish it was a, a bit more developed at times, went in more directions than that one piece, which gets repeated a lot. Not yeah. the only one, but but yeah, that one does appear a bit too often. But I mean, I enjoy it. I mean, it's. Um, you know, if it fits the aesthetic, for me, that's what's more important. Even if the piece itself is rather simple and, um, you know, not there's not much to say about the, the composition itself, but I, I think it fits really well with the scenes. Although sometimes I think he uses it a bit, a bit out of place <laughs> <laughs> because it's very mellow. So sometimes right after a dramatic scene seems a bit off, but, you know... Uh, Choices, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> not sure I agree with them all, but um, I do think it fits a lot of the times. And that's my two cents. And that's, that's two, two cents. cents, everybody. That's all for today, folks. If you'd like to reach out and suggest a film for the next episode, you can find us on the podcast official Instagram and Facebook pages. Don't forget to subscribe, share this episode, or simply give us a like. That's how our podcast can grow ever more groovy. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. And we'll see you in a better tomorrow. We'll see you in a better tomorrow.